God. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be God forever. The kingdoms of this earth belong to God and his Christ forever and ever. Amen. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then you believe the right thing. You become qualified for the kingdom. Amen. Uh, I had this conversation. Uh, Cindy and I spent uh, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday with just the best of the best. Rama, amen, with our uh, RMAI Northeast Regional Retreat. We had uh, Tony Cook came in, and he taught just so well. And uh, Pastor Sam, who's our uh, regional director, is just a, a wonderful man, uh, Amish guy. And uh, he has that. I actually noticed that the, the first night we were there, he was kind of strolling through the crowd. And he reminded me of a gentleman farmer. Just walking through and checking the cattle in the quenning. I said, Pastor, you look like a gentleman farmer just checking the cattle in the cool of the evening. He said, Know the condition of your flock. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And then we have uh, wonderful district directors uh, in Doug and Christine Mitchell. Uh, they're doing a really, really, really good job. And uh, uh, Pastor Adam, we have to shout out to Pastor Adam and his team down there at Grace. Family Church, they just did a magnificent job. We had a, a pig roast Tuesday night that, good God. <laughs> uh, so I have literally been immersed all week. Amen. Amen. Pra praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, it is a good thing. Uh, but our mission is to seek and save that which is lost. Amen. And that's why I like to remind you that you are born again. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you confess that with your mouth, you are born again. And you changed the trajectory of your life forever. Where you were dying and going to hell and being separated from God forever. And in that moment you said, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. Come into my heart. Boom. Boom. You're translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Amen. And God becomes your heavenly Father. Woo! And you have this spirit of adoption by which you cry, Abba. Hallelujah. Father. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And so, uh, who do we want to give a shout out to now? Jaden and Olivia. Hello, Jaden and Olivia. How are you doing? How are you doing? Woo! <laughs> Glory to God. We want to welcome all of you that we were just waving at. Uh, thank you for joining us on the live stream. Amen. Our e-church, our extended family. Amen. Uh, it is a privilege to break open the word of God with you. Uh, but we would like to invite you here to 28 Chapel Street here in Wallingford, Connecticut on Friday nights at 7 and on Sunday mornings at 1030. Amen. Amen. Come be part of this family of believers. Amen. We, I, My commitment to you is that we will treat you well and you will be most welcomed. Amen. We're going to start a new series tonight. Woo! Uh, we, we wrapped up for now how to be led by the Spirit of God. How many of you know you cannot get to the end of a subject in the Bible? That's right. You will spend all of eternity studying the Word of God. Amen. Amen. And it will take all of eternity to know all of it. Isn't that amazing? Amen. And every time you get revelation, you'll spend a hundred thousand years going, oh God, that's so good. Oh, that is so good. Wow, that's good. Wow, that's all. Oh, that's so good. Amen. I Listen, I'm a presence junkie. Amen. Hallelujah. I know that when I get to glory, I'll spend 10 or 15,000 years just at the throne. Right? Just, oh, God. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're so good. You're rescue. Look where I'm at. Hallelujah. That's me. Amen. You, listen, you do what you want when you get to heaven. Right? I, I plan on spending those first eight or nine or ten millennia just right there. Yeah, thank you. Woo-hoo! Oh. Hallelujah. Amen. But um, I believe, uh, and it was seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
this began getting stirred in me. Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I just thought it would be good to go back and begin to teach on prayer. Thank you. Oh, I got two. Right? Prayer. In a series called The Art of Prayer. Amen. So, some of you may have already been taught on prayer. Some of you may have read some books on prayer. Some of you might have read the Bible on prayer. But what is required is that you take a look at these scriptures with fresh eyes. Yeah. That you open up your spirit and remain teachable. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a success in life, in ministry, out of ministry, in business, in family, whatever it is that you put your hands to, if you want to be successful, you must remain teachable. Amen. That's good. Amen. Sitting there saying, oh, I've heard this already. I sure do hope he finishes up quick so I can order Chinese food. <laughs> Amen. Uh, well, maybe that's just me. <laughs> Amen. Fresh eyes, fresh ears, leaning in, Le leaning in, spiritually speaking. Amen. Uh, you know, I could say this: that prayer meeting is the least attended function that a church has. Right now, I can say it's an indictment against the church that we need Bozo the Clown and Fifi the Dog and pasta and cookout we need, we, glitter and they, they, to get people to come to church. Right? Uh, I think, my personal opinion, is that every church should have a 12-foot chain link fence around it with no gate. And the top of it should be wrapped in razor wire. And the pastor should stand in the door of the church with a baseball bat. <laughs> And if you can get over the fence and the razor wire and pass the pastor into the building, then you, you should be there. Right? We, we live in a country where, you know, if the air conditioning isn't just right, <laughs> if the cushions aren't just right, if the carpeting isn't just right, right? Uh, you know, again, we spent a, a bunch of time with, with some wonderful pastors and when you sit with pastors and you hear their heartbreak, right, because pastors have a heart for people, mm -hmm. and you hear their, and you see, physically see their heart breaking because of people not coming back to church after COVID, yeah. or people saying, well, uh, you know, you're not, you don't do this, or you don't do that, or you don't say this, or you don't say that, or your stance is wrong, your stance, whatever, and people, and their heart is broken because people are finding excuses, thank you, Mike, a bucket of excuses not to go to church or not to attend, not to be around like-minded believers. Amen? Uh, it would seem to me that, and this is part of what started stirring this, I said something from the pulpit, either on a Sunday or on a Wednesday, that one of the reasons why prayer meetings are so lightly attended is because maybe, perhaps, Christians don't think prayer works. They don't believe in it. If they believed in it, think about this. If they believe that prayer really worked, like, like when I pray, God hears and God answers my prayers, don't you think that a prayer meeting would be bricked? Yeah, come on. I mean, no sitting, I standing room <coughs> only. Yeah. Right? People out in the parking lot. Uh, uh, Reverend Tony shared with us uh, about a group, I can't remember the name of the group, uh, that, but they had a hundred year prayer meeting, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for a hundred years. People believed in prayer, believed in prayer. In this modern microwave society, I'm thinking not so much. I remember listening to Brother Hagen in class. And listen, we're going we're gonna to get into teaching. I want to lay a foundation here. Right? And it's not about what's gone wrong. But there is there's something missing. And I'm believing God that through the course of this teaching, we'll find what's been missing. Right? But Brother Hagen would talk about going to visit someone in the hospital. 
and he would spend hours praying in the Holy Ghost for the sick person mm -hmm. in the bed. Hours. To the point where he would begin to feel their symptoms in his own body. And then they would get up and they would be healed. Come on, someone. Amen. What's, what's my, he, he must have believed yes. in it yes. to stay connected for hours. Yeah. Right? Uh, and even preparing uh, for, for tonight was reading the story of a man whose son was run over by a car. Right? And uh, uh, broke his neck. Uh, had crushed some of his spine. He was going to be paralyzed from the neck down if he survived at all. And I don't know what kind of emergency surgeries they did. I don't, I don't know. But he all, what I do know is that when his father heard of the accident and got to the hospital, his son was already in surgery. When he comes out, he is head to toe in a cast. And he asked for permission to stay by his son's side that night. And prayed all night long in the Holy Ghost for his boy. He must have believed something to stay there all night long. And in the morning, when his son's eyes opened and the enormity of what, was, what had happened to him began to come crashing in, he said, son, I just, I just want you to agree with me. Right? That you are healed. Come on. Yeah. That you are healed. And the doctor comes in, and the doctor, you know, hearing, hearing the father talking to the son said, Listen, we, we need to talk. His neck was broken, his back was crushed. We did the best we could, but he's not healed. He's never going to walk again. And the father said, No, my son is healed. And the doctor's like, listen, I, I was in there. <laughs> I saw, Doc, my son is healed. As a matter of fact, x-ray him and let him go home. And after several hours of saying to the doctor, x-ray him and let him go home, the doctor finally relented and x-rayed him. They couldn't find a break in the x-ray. Oh, they cut him out of the cast. They did keep him overnight the second night, just to be sure. But that young man walked out of the hospital Praise the God. next day. So there, there's, there's an ingredient missing in the postmodern church. I think part of it has to do with the microwave society that we live in. But I also believe this, that the devil is taking advantage of our comfort. It requires something to pray all night long. It requires something to go to the bedside of somebody you don't know and pray all night long. Right? Right? Perhaps you know, these old timers used to call it praying through. You know, back in the 18 and 1900s where they would just stay at it and pray. Come on, somebody. There's something to be said about these ones that went before us. They understood if they were farmers, and most of them were, there was no John Deere laying down eight rows at a time. You went out there with a piece of metal and hopefully you had a stick and you hacked. <laughs> Come on. You hacked a living out of the ground, and it took time. Come on. So, let's get into this. Amen? Hallelujah. The art of prayer. Glory to God. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Go to Philippians chapter 2. You know, it's very easy to say, I'm going to give you six keys to prayer, four secrets of prayer. Uh, but there's more than that. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. And, and 
this whole business of secrets. We got a Bible. Yeah. <laughs> how, how secret can it be? <laughs> we we yeah. can read about it all we want. Mm -hmm. Amen. So uh, tonight I want to talk to you about uh, the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. And start start a foundation of power. Somebody say power. power. So in Philippians chapter 2, the Bible says in uh, verse 8, He became human, my translation says, and humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a man and was obedient. He was a perfect example even in his death, a criminal's death by crucifixion. Verse 9. Because of that obedience, God exalted him and multiplied his greatness. And he now has been given the greatest of all names. The New Living Translation says it like this. Therefore, God elevated him, who? Jesus. To the highest place of honor and gave him a name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, Amen. and under earth. Amen. Do we need to stop and underline each of those words in your Bible? That at the name. One translation says, at the mention of the name of Jesus every big word every knee bows That's right. in heaven mm -hmm. on the earth and under the earth right. well who's living under the earth the devil. hallelujah yeah. glory to God John 16, 23. And this is the foundation that I want to lay. Or maybe I should phrase it this way. This is the scripture the Holy Spirit took me to, to lay the foundation for this series. John 16, 23. And in that day, you will ask me nothing. This is Jesus teaching his disciples now. He's getting ready to leave the earth. He's getting ready to be crucified. He's getting ready to be raised from the dead. He's getting ready to be exalted and lifted into this high position. That's above every. Are you listening to me? But when somebody's getting ready to leave the earth, don't you think it's important to pay attention to what they're saying? Yeah. That the, the, the things that the individual is communicating are very important because he knows he's about to go. Amen? Hallelujah. And he says, and in that day you'll ask me nothing. Jesus has spent the previous three and a half years going around in healing, delivering, and setting free. Come on. And destroying all the works of the devil. <coughs> and now he's talking about a day where you'll ask me nothing. What does that mean? Where you're not going to be asking Jesus for anything. I know this is starting to mess with me. Stay hooked up. <laughs> Stay hooked up. I say to you, what? I say to you, whatever you ask the Father, whatever you ask the Father in my name, well, if you've been extra good, he'll give it to you. If you fast for 30 or 40 days, no. 
What does your Bible say? He says, ask the Father in my name, and he'll give it to you. Ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. At that moment, Jesus is telling his church, his disciples, the ecclesia, there'll come a point in time. What time? After I've been crucified, after I've been raised from the dead, after I ascend to the place of authority in all of the universe, in that day, you'll ask my Father in my name, and he'll give it to you. Praise God. Is that the dispensation that we live in right now? Yes. It is, isn't it? That's exactly where we are. Amen? Amen. Now, I want to get ahead of myself by two or three weeks. Patience and perseverance, the snail gets on board the ark. Treating God like some kind of genie isn't going to get it done. As a matter of fact, when we get into this, you'll see that the adversary is the one who's been holding it back from you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, verse 24, Jesus says, Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and the implication there is, ask in my name, and you will receive what? That your joy, somebody say, my joy, my joy. will be full. My, my, my. When you ask God in the name of Jesus, there is a purpose behind it. Your joy would be full. Well, how, listen, let me ask you a question. How does, how, how does somebody's joy get full? It's not a trick question. What? 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 Surprise! They get... What they need when they ask that your joy would be full. Now, listen, I hear it out there. Well, you know, people get greedy. And James talked about it. The Lord's half brother talked about it. The reason that your prayers aren't answered is because you ask amiss. Now, we're not there yet. I want to lay this foundation. Oh, Lord, let me win the lottery tonight, and I'll just show you how good of a Christian I can be. That is not a godly prayer. Amen. Ha hallelujah. <laughs> we'll get there. Glory to God. He says, until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Mark 16. We're just laying a foundation. But I thought I would start at the most powerful place I knew to start. The name of of Jesus, and I really do like that translation that says at the mention. There's, there, I've been noticing this in in, in Christian <coughs> circles, right? That uh, I'm, I'm, listen, I'm cool with loud prayer. <clears throat> when the glory of God, the anointing comes on me, sometimes I get loud. Sometimes I don't need the anointing to come on me to get loud, and sometimes I pray real quiet. I know that's a shock. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but it would almost seem like some Christians think that the louder you say in the name of Jesus, ah, throw that little ah on the end. That adds a little, little, little something to it. <laughs> come, come on. I also notice this. Lord, bless them. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Lord, bless them. Lord, bless them in the name of Jesus. They keep repeating. Well, let me ask you a question. And this is not a knock. It's just I, I want to start provoking your thinking by the Holy Ghost. Do you believe that the name of Jesus works? Yes. yes. The Bible says that at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee bows. So wouldn't the first time be good enough? Why repeat it? We think that we're adding some emphasis to it. Listen, I, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is separate emotion from spirit. 
right? Because people do get moved by emotional prayers. Oh Lord Jesus, oh Lord Jesus. Sounds good. Does it look good, right? Starting to kneel and get, you know, get, get real serious with it. Right? This emotionalism isn't going to get it across the finish line, folks. You know what gets it across the finish line? Getting way ahead of myself now. Faith. And Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, then you have more than enough in you to whip the devil right now. Oh, and now I've given you my name. I'm telling you, this is going to revolutionize how some of us have been praying. Amen. Are you listening to me? Mm -hmm. Do you believe what James, the Lord's hack brother, said? That prayer makes tremendous power available? Well, then Thursday night's here. should be overflowing. Amen. Because people... Oh, Lord, send your power. Send your power. Lord, I need your power. Jesus, I need your power. Come on. <laughs> and the Bible says that just praying makes tremendous power available. Oh, by the way, you have all the power you're ever going to need. It's on the inside of you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit currently live on the inside of every born-again believer. So why are we asking him to send more power? We have it all. We've got it all. Jesus is up in heaven. You got it. Send the power. You got it. Jesus. And we get moved by emotionalism. And then if they, and listen, if they throw the worship team in behind it. <laughs> Woo! Oh, they got the music going, and they got the prayer going. Listen to me. Jesus asked the disciples this question after his resurrection. Have you any meat? Asking them, is what you're doing working? And if we're not getting answered to prayer, don't you think we should stop? Even if we're intellectually dishonest, don't you think we should just stop for a moment and say, I'm praying according to the Bible and my prayer isn't being answered. What's wrong with the movie? And go to fixing it. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Are you there in Mark 16? And these miracle signs will accompany those that believe. Somebody say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. They'll drive out demons. In the power of my name. They will speak in tongues. They will be supernaturally protected from snakes. And if they drink anything poisonous, it shall not harm them. And if they lay their hands on the sick, the sick will recover. Amen. Period. Period. Every believer has been entrusted with a healing ministry. Amen. So, pray to get results. Loving, hopeful air telegrams that maybe God will hear me, maybe he won't, maybe he'll answer, maybe he won't. That isn't prayer. It isn't even hope. That's some kind of wishy-washy Charlie Brown. Oh, I sure do hope God hears this one. Oh, I sure do hope God answers this one. When the Bible says that hope is a confident, joyous expectation of something good. If you have true biblical hope, it's a confident, somebody say confident. Confident. Joyous. Joyous. Yeah, you're happy. What? You're confident, come on, that he's heard you. You're confident that he'll answer. You're joyful because he heard you. You're joyful because you're getting your answer. Right. It's a confident, joyous expectation yes. of something good. Amen. So maybe the reason that prayer is so lightly attended is that the church has lost its expectation. Mm -hmm. Not here at Faith Bible Church, of course. 
Amen. And then we there was this 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 move or this teaching or this belief system uh, that the only way you can get anything done is to get intercessors. Now there are those that are called to intercede. It is it is their gift. But listen to me, I shouldn't say gift. It's their call. Right? 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 It's their, it's their call. It's, it's, it's the skill, the talent that God has placed in them. But every believer should have a confident, joyous expectation that God hears and answers. Amen. Confident. Not arrogant. Well, let me back this up for you with Scripture. Isaiah 43, verse 25. I, even I, am he who blots out and cancels your transgressions for my own name's sake. I will not remember your sins. Verse 26. Put me in remembrance. And let us plead and argue together. Set forth, forth your case that you may be Justified. Did you see this? Put me in remembrance. God says, put me in remembrance. Those who have been mighty in prayer have always reminded God of what his word says. God says, put me in remembrance. Of what? What I said. So if I'm going to pray at all, if I'm going to be uh, biblical, then I better have Bible on what I'm praying for or what I'm praying about. Yes. Amen. Amen. So winning the lottery, does that throw that right out? It does, doesn't it? God doesn't fix lottery games. Oh, Lord, let the Yankees win one. God doesn't fix baseball games either. Oh, Lord, just let the Giants catch the football. The Lord doesn't fix football games. Are you listening to me? <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Smith Wigglesworth said this. He said, God delights in his children having the audacity of faith to say, God, you promised it. Now do it. When you pray according to the word of God, you are now making God responsible for the results. He said, my word will not return to me void, but it will accomplish what I sent it out to accomplish. And I, listen, I've had these discussions with people that come from different denominations or different backgrounds of their, their pastor isn't teaching right and they want to argue with them or oh, you're going to make God responsible for his word. Yes. Yes, Jesus hung, bled, and died for every word that's in that Bible. Amen. Apparently it was important enough to God to have his son be crucified for it, yes. to shed his blood for it, to have the word, the blood of God, to be, uh, yeah, the blood of God ratify the word of God. It would seem to me that God takes his word pretty important. Amen. Fairly seriously. Amen. 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 Now, the Lord has said this to me during worship. I was meditating on that scripture. That my word will not return to me void. And one morning during worship, I heard this in my spirit. Didn't hear an audible voice, just hear in my spirit. The word of God never returns to me void. But it can return to you void if there's no faith. And I went, he's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. If I don't mix my faith with the word of God, I will not get God's results. Mm -hmm. But God promises, if I mix my faith the size of a mustard seed with his word, praying in line with it in the name of Jesus, he will do it. Amen. He'll change the face of Wallingford. What? Well, because that's how we're praying. He'll change the surrounding towns. What? What? Because that's how we're praying. He'll change the state of Connecticut. What? That's how we're praying. He'll change the Northeast. 
Amen. He'll change the country. That's right. Amen. Amen. I had a, a conversation with some ministers on Tuesday night. We were playing Quates. Amish game. Now watch out for those bad boys. <laughs> Joshua, in order to defeat his enemy, points at the sun and says, Son, stand still. <clears throat> and you know what God did? He stopped the sun from moving. He stopped the earth from rotating. He stopped the galaxy from moving. He stopped the universe. Why? Because his son asked. That's right. That's right. And God did it. Listen to me. In the Old Testament. Under the Old Covenant. How much more? Are you listening to me? Psalm 2 says, you know, the nations raise and the heathen plot. To ask of me and I'll give you the nations. Hallelujah. Well, we've asked the Lord for Wallingford. We've asked him for Connecticut. We've asked him for the Northeast. We've asked him for the country. And you know what's happening? Just that. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> Glory. Glory. Matthew 7 and verse 9, Jesus is teaching. Don't you love when Jesus teaches? He says, do you know of any parent who would give his hungry child who asked for food a plate of rocks instead? Or if he asked for a piece of fish, what, what parent would offer his child a snake? If you, imperfect as you are, know how to lovingly care for your children and give them what's best, how much more ready is your Heavenly Father to give you wonderful gifts to those who ask Him? Psalm 118 and verse 5 says, Out of my distress. Can we stop right there? Have you ever been distressed? Come on. Out of my distress, I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me. If you don't have that underlined in your Bible, Psalm 118 and verse 5, the Lord answered me and set me free in a large place. Hallelujah. Then he goes on, he says, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Verse 7 says, the Lord is on my side and takes my part. He is among those who helps me. Listen, we can shout for about a month right there. I cry out to God, he hears me. He sets me free. He's on my side. Glory to God. He takes my part. He's among those who helps me. Psalm 18, verse 6. That was Psalm 118. Psalm 18 in verse 6 says, in my distress. Do you see a theme here? You know, we kind of overlook the word distress because, you know, we don't use it in modern vernacular. I got trouble. <laughs> and it's piling high. Distress sounds very, you know, just sounds a little too cute. <laughs> and so we dismiss it. This Stress. Yeah. Psalmist was stressed. Mm -hmm. You ever been stressed? Yeah. Dear Lord, in my distress, I cried out to my God and he heard my voice in his temple. When you pray, God hears your voice, child of God. And not next week, not next month, not a year from now. You're not waiting on that. The moment you cry out, he hears you. Amen. That's right. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You know, my mom and dad were off the boat from Ireland, and my father had a Claire brogue, and my mother had a Litra brogue. I can hear them in my ear right now. When I played sports and, and they were in the stands, I can hear my father's brogue. Take your man out to the wings and then drive that ball in low and hard. I can hear him. 
I can hear my mother's voice. When you cry, God hears his children. And listen to me. And you can hear his voice right back. You are one of his sheep. Hallelujah. And you know his voice. Amen. I'm, I don't you know, feel like doing it like this. He heard my voice in his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears. Aren't you glad that you serve a God that hears? He's not made out of wood or stone. He's not carved. He hears you when you cry out. And I'll wrap up here this evening. In Ephesians 6 and 12, the Bible says we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So if you're going to pray, pray with all faith. Pray in faith. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word when you pray in the name of Jesus listen to me check the box it's done it's done amen hallelujah glory to God yeah I'll give you this I think you can handle it can you handle it one, one more nugget. In the Old Testament, and actually in, in culture, someone's name was very important. You named them because of characteristics. You named them because of family. You, I mean, names carried weight. They were important. Right? God gave Jesus his name. God gave Jesus his name. Yahshua. Which means salvation. Salvation is Zoe. It's life as God has it. Come on. So when you're praying in the name of Jesus, you ready? You're praying in his nature. God gave Jesus his name based on his nature, his characteristics. Yahshua means salvation. When you pray in the name of Jesus, you're praying in the same nature of Jesus. Which means salvation. And salvation is the total package. It's Zoe. Are you listening to me? So when you pray, you're already praying in victory. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let me pray for you.